Uh, Larry Downs, uh, Project Director of the Evolution of Regulation and Innovation Project at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. And it is my great uh, honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, uh, FTC Commissioner Maureen Allhausen, who was sworn in as a commissioner in April of 2012 to a term that expires uh, in September of 2018. Uh, commissioner Allhausen previously, and I, I have to say I usually, uh, you know, like to do short bios, but there's so many highlights for Commissioner Olhausen. I'm just going to give you a little bit of it. Uh, the rest is in the program. Um, uh, before becoming a commissioner, uh, Commissioner Olhausen served at the commission for 11 years, most recently as the director of the Office of Policy Planning from 2004 to 2008, uh, where she told us last night that was her favorite job. Um, <laughs> so this is, you know, a, a close second. Uh, and she also led at that time the FTC's uh, Internet Access Task Force. She was also deputy director of that office, and from 20, 90, 1998 to 2001, she was the attorney advisor for former Commissioner or Orson um, Swindle, advising him on competition and consumer protection matters, and started at the General Counsel's office in 1997. Um, before coming to the FTC, uh, Commissioner Olhausen spent five years at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit as a law clerk for uh, Judge uh, David Santel and as a staff attorney. And she's also clerk for Judge uh, Robert Yock of the U.S. Court of Federal Claims from 91 to 92. So a very distinguished career in public service as well as private, which I didn't even mention. Uh, we're very pleased to have her here today. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Olhausen to our event. Uh, well, thank you, Larry, so much for that very kind introduction. And thanks very much to the Georgetown Center for Business and Public, Wire, uh, Public Policy and the Wireless Technology Association for hosting me uh, here today. I understand you've had lots of interesting technical discussions this morning, uh, so I will move away from the technical to the more policy-oriented uh, part, part of the, the discussion. But today's conference is exploring the potential of future wireless technologies uh, that continue to transform the world in which we live. And I'm going to focus on one particularly important area of in innovation that has a symbiotic relationship with wireless technologies, which is the Internet of Things. Um, IoT applications already rely heavily on wireless technologies and stand to benefit greatly from future advances. The IoT has prompted a lot of discussion in policy circles about how to best facilitate the benefits while minimizing any potential risks. Uh, today, I'll set the scene by discussing some of the revolutionary opportunities IoT offers. Uh, then I'll examine the biggest policy challenges that IoT faces, which I believe is regulation based on the precautionary principle, and then offer four principles to avoid that outcome. The Internet of Things promises substantial benefits to consumers in every economic situation and to enterprises of all sizes. A recent study by McKinsey Global Institute gives perspective. It estimates that IoT will have an economic impact of between $3.9 trillion and $11.1 trillion per year by 2025. Uh, even the low-end estimate is approximately the size of the German economy today. The McKinsey report estimates that although consumer applications such as fitness monitors, like my Fitbit, and self-driving cars get a lot of attention, Business-to-business -business applications will generate 70% of the total benefits from IoT. Uh, these benefits likely include optimized factory and hospital operations, healthier and safer work sites, and improved logistics and navigation. Consumers will greatly benefit from these B2B improvements as the products and services they purchase become more customized, higher quality, safer, and less expensive. So while consumer applications may, will not be the largest slice of the benefit of the Internet of Things, these benefits remain ap, uh, significant in absolute uh, economic terms and in their impact on individual lives. Uh, McKinsey estimates a benefit of $170 billion to $1.6 trillion annually by 2025 from IoT applications dedicated to monitoring and treating or improving uh, wellness. Uh, conservative estimates indicate that IoT applications could reduce the cost of care for chronic disease by 10 to 15 percent. At dinner last night, we were talking a little bit about what's going to be sort of the killer app driving uh, the in Internet of Things. 
uh, and uh, I didn't offer my opinion then, but I will offer it now. I think a lot of it will come from medical monitoring, uh, the ability to give people care, monitoring, oversight in their homes as a, a, a way to help reduce health care costs, improve wellness, and give people a benefit. M often people would prefer to be in a home setting rather than an institutional setting like a hospital. Um, these benefits will be worldwide. Uh, experts anticipate uh, that emerging economies will be able to leapfrog to IoT solutions, similar to the way they, they le uh, leapfrogged over wireline to wireless communications, uh, as they built out infrastructure in the near future. Uh, one estimate suggests that emerging economies will receive about 50% of the total benefits of the Internet of Things technologies. Wireless technologies will play a key role in this Internet, connected to and connecting everything. By, its very, by uh, its very nature, IoT devices need reliable, secure wireless communications. Cisco's latest uh, report estimates that approximately 50 billion devices will be online by 2020. And this will create technical challenges for wireless innovators. Although many um, uh, consumer IoT devices are low bandwidth applications that may rely on unlicensed spectrum, such as Wi-Fi networks, the sheer number of them is likely to tax the available bandwidth and network uh, resources. Municipal applications such as smart parking and traffic control might require tens of thousands of connections across a city. Uh, and some industrial applications such as pipeline monitoring or precision farming require reliable communications from rural and remote areas. Um, IoT is going to need uh, every ounce of creativity in the wireless communications industry. Perhaps for this crowd, the most obvious policy concern prompted by massive amounts of new devices coming in online is, where are we going to get the spectrum? Um, although that's a really important issue, um, I'm not going to talk about it, as that tough problem is in the hands of other agencies. You know, few for me, I'm glad about that. Um, <laughs> instead, I want to address another important policy concern that may be less obvious but which I think poses great risk to achieving the full benefits of IoT technology. That is IoT policy and regulation based on the precautionary principle. So the precautionary principle is the idea that new technologies must be restricted until policymakers and regulators are satisfied that it will not cause harm to individuals, groups, or cultural norms, for example. The precautionary principle often enters in the, the policy discussion whenever a disruptive technology emerges. By its very nature, innovation changes things, and change is uncomfortable. It can cause some harms, and we're always developing new strategies to adapt. Uh, we have some experts in strat strategies here today. Uh, Larry wrote a whole book on how businesses can adapt and adjust to modern innovation, the modern innovation cycle that he calls Big Bang Disruption. The Internet of Things is likely to magnify the effect of this Big Bang disruption, and maybe Larry's next book will be titled Bigger Bang Disrup Disruption. Uh, some people, however, take a less positive approach to change. Uh, as long as there's been innovation, there have been detractors and doomsayers. Uh, pessimism about innovation sells newspapers and books. Uh, it also has a surprising intellectual cachet. Uh, the man who despairs when others hope is admired by a large class of persons as a sage, said John Stuart Mill. Uh, William Petty, the economist and doctor, said, when a new invention is first propounded, in the beginning every man objects, and the poor inventor runs the gauntlet of all petulant wits. Uh, and he was speaking in 1679. Uh, the Internet of Things faces that gauntlet today. Reports estimate that IoT devices fall under the jurisdiction of at least two dozen separate federal agencies and more than 30 different congressional committees. So in addition to the FTC, regulatory agencies actively exploring IoT policy include the FAA, FCC, FDA, NIST, NTIA, NHTSA, and several others. Uh, new stories about IoT regularly emphasize the potential risks to safety and privacy and dignity. In such an environment, it's no surprise that some policy makers echo these concerns. But I worry that these concerns are paving the way for the precautionary principle approach to Internet of Things technology. 
Such an approach would deny the potential benefits of IoT, or at least delay it. Innovation requires experimentation and rapid failure. It requires failing better. Failures can harm someone or something, and those harms need to be addressed by regulators, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But a strategy to prevent any and all potential harms will foreclose benefits as well. So if the precautionary principle is the wrong approach, what is the right one? Uh, Mercatus Center scholar Adam Thierer has labeled it permissionless innovation. That's the idea that experimentation with new technology and business models should generally be permitted by default. I believe that regulators can support permissionless innovation in IoT if they adopt four principles. First, tell the story of innovation and its benefits. Second, apply regulatory humility. Third, focus on actual consumer harm. And finally, use tools appropriate to the task. I'm going to elaborate a little bit on each of these principles and give you some examples of some successes or failures in this uh, area. So the first thing that regulators can do is uh, to promote permissionless innovation in IoT is to promote an accurate understanding of the dramatic benefits of innovation even in the face of constant skepticism. Psychologists tell us that people are often pessimistic about society overall, even though they are generally optimistic about their own prospects. Uh, but media and politics often feeds this pessimistic side. But as Matt Ridley's book, The Rational Optimist, demonstrates in detail, we live in remarkable times. We are the beneficiaries of a 200-year-plus period of innova innovation that so shows no signs of stopping. Indeed, IoT technology shows every signs of accelerating the innovation and the resulting benefits. And we ought to publicize this history. But this history has different lessons for different constituents. For regulators, it counsels the second of my four principles. Approach new technology and new business models with regulatory humility. Now, regulatory humility is my name for recognizing the inherent limitations of regulation and acting according to those limits. Regulators face a fundamental knowledge problem that limits the effective reach of regulation. A regulator must learn about the present state and future trends of an industry being regulated. The more prescriptive the regulation and the more complex the industry, the more detailed knowledge the regulator must collect. But regulators simply cannot gather all the information relevant to every problem. Such information is widely distributed and therefore very expensive to collect. Even when a regulator manages to collect information, it quickly becomes out of date as regulated industries continue to evolve. Obsolete data is a particular, particular concern for regulators of fast-changing technological fields like the Internet of Things. This knowledge problem means that centralized problem solving cannot make the full use of available knowledge about a problem. Therefore, centralized regulation generally offers worse solutions when compared to distributed or emergent solutions such as markets or social norms. Regulatory humility means seeking to understand new technologies while, uh, while recognizing the limits of what regulation can achieve. Now, regulatory humility is all well and good, and while doomsday scenarios about innovation are wrong, consumers are sometimes harmed. What then? My third principle for regulators is to focus on identifying and addressing real, not speculative, consumer harm. At the FTC, this is part of our core statute. Congress charged us in Section 5 of the FTC Act with preventing deceptive or unfair acts or practices. Deceptive acts violate Section 5 only if they are material, which means that they actually harm consumers. And practices are only unfair if there is a substantial harm that consumers cannot avoid and it is not outweighed by benefits to consumers or competition. In both cases, the FTC law focuses on actual consumer harm. Likewise, the FTC carefully evaluates consumer welfare, or its corollary consumer harm, when we exercise our antitrust authority. So not only does the law require the FTC to focus on consumer harm, such a focus is also good policy. 
Agencies have limited resources, and we should generally spend those resources to stop existing or very likely harms rather than trying to prevent uh, speculative or insubstantial harms. By focusing its enforcement on practices that are actually harming or likely to harm consumers, the FTC has generally limited forays into speculative harms, and we've therefore generally preserved our resources for clearly harmful violations. And I believe this self-restraint has been uh, important to the FTC's success in stopping consumer harms without disrupting innovation. Unfortunately, some recent FTC pronouncements on IoT are a bit of a mixed bag in this regard. So we put out an Internet of Things report earlier this year, and we properly rejected calls for Internet-specific legislation as premature, given the lack of evidence of harms unique to IoT. The report also appropriately emphasized the importance of data security in IoT devices because some insecure IoT devices have actually resulted in consumer harm, and the FTC has brought some enforcement actions. But for many IoT devices, such as connected cars, for instance, there are strong markets incentives to focus on data security, and those incentives are driving improvements. However, however, there are legitimate questions about incentives for cheap, nearly disposable devices that may be more expensive to patch than to simply replace. Um, I understand, however, that there are industry efforts to make even inexpensive devices more secure at the chip level, and I applaud those efforts. Uh, on the other hand, the FTC report, IoT report, urged data minimization. So without examining the costs or benefits, the report encouraged companies to delete valuable data that could have many unanticipated beneficial uses. And the report proposed this practice out of concern over largely hypothetical future harms, adopting a precautionary principle, appro uh, principle approach. Uh, and I therefore dissented from that recommendation in the staff report. Uh, unfortunately, there's another recent example of the FTC failing to focus on real consumer harms in a case against Nomi Technologies. Uh, this was a startup that provided data uh, about consumer traffic in a hashed, uh, anonymous form to its retail merchant clients. Um, Nomi aggregated this data uh, by receiving and storing hash versions of the publicly uh, broadcast MAC address from consumers' Wi-Fi, um, uh, excuse me, smartphones using Wi-Fi. But it, he, uh, Nomi was a third-party contractor collecting no personally identifiable information. So it had no legal obligation to offer consumers the ability to opt out. Uh, but since the service started, Nomi did offer consumers a global opt out uh, at, uh, at its website. But its privacy policy also said that consumers could opt out uh, at retailers uh, who were using the technology. But unfortunately, none of the retail clients um, uh, offered that opportunity to opt out. Thus, their privacy policy was partially inaccurate. Uh, the majority of FTC commissioners supported a complaint that alleged that Nomi's inaccurate privacy policy was deceptive, and they imposed a 20-year settlement uh, on the company. Um, I dissented from the complaint and settlement in this case because I didn't think that the evidence showed there was any real consumer harm. Consumers who wanted to opt out used the uh, functioning global opt out, and Nomi's partially inaccurate statement likely injured no consumers. I was concerned that by bringing this case, the, the majority was imposing a de facto strict liability standard to a young company that tried to offer privacy protections that went beyond its legal obligation. Um, and I'm concerned that this decision discourages companies from doing any more than the bare minimum on privacy and may ultimately make consumers worse off. So the final way that regulators can spur innovation in the IoT is to use appropriate tools to solve issues that do emerge. Uh, the tools that an agency uses make a large different in difference in agency effectiveness. Uh, for fast-changing technologies like IoT, agencies need tools that are nimble and transparent and incremental. Um, often, we equate regulation with large APA-style rulemaking. And such ex-ante rulemaking set out rules, often industry-wide in scope, to prevent future harms. Uh, but for the reasons I already discussed, including the knowledge problem, regulators struggle to construct effective rules and to update such rules in a timely manner. And such prescriptive ex-ante regulation can hinder innovation. 
So for example, if an innovative new project or service doesn't easily fit in a particular statutory or regulatory box, the innovator may be uncertain about how to comply with the law. Uh, a good example of a nimble and transparent and incremental regulatory approach is the FTC's case-by-case -case enforcement process, which is very different from APA rulemaking. Although we do have rulemaking authority, the FTC uses it very infrequently, and we generally proceed by case-by-case -case enforcement. I think that this case-by-case uh, -case approach reduces the knowledge problem. Addressing a specific case at hand requires far less information than, for example, an industry-wide rulemaking to address similar issues. Uh, furthermore, ex post enforcement requires particular facts on the ground and a specifically alleged harm. And it generally only directly applies to the party to the enforcement action. And this better limits the potential unintended consequences of a regulatory action. And I think this is particularly important in a fast-moving field like the Internet of Things. Finally, another nimble and transparent incremental tool is self-regulation, with enfor agency enforcement as a backstop. So compared to traditional government regulation, self-regulation has the potential to be more prompt and flexible and responsive when business models or technology changes. Self-regulatory frameworks are easier to reconfigure than legislative or regulatory systems, and they're much more likely to reflect market realities, at least when sufficiently supported and informed by industry members. Uh, so the FTC provides a regulatory backstop uh, because companies who promise to adhere to the self-regulatory guides uh, or principles and don't adhere to them are subject to, the, to FTC deception enforcement. And I'm glad to see that uh, the Internet of Things space has uh, already had some developments in self-regulation in the automotive space. And I understand there's some other discussions uh, underway. So just to conclude, I am what author Matt Ridley would call a rational optimist when I think about the future of an Internet connected to everything. So fueled by supportive social attitudes and free market institutions, innovators, including innovators in the wireless industry, have been the engines of prosperity. And regulators who don't want to stall these engines of innovation should remember the long beneficial history of innovation, uh, remain humble about what they know and what they can accomplish, and uh, focus on addressing real consumer harm and apply appropriate tools to address the harms that do arise. Um, I am hopeful that these four principles will help maximize IoT's promise to continue innovation's upward trajectory of prosperity for the benefit of consumers. Uh, so thank you so much for listening, uh, and I would be happy to take uh, any questions. And they don't have to be limited to the topics I raised in my remarks. Hi, Mike Klaus with Fujitsu. Uh, the FTC was the enforcement agency for the US EU Safe Harbor Agreement. Yes. It was struck down. What's your view of the ECJ's decision and how that affects cross border data flow and in the Internet of Things? I am concerned because Europe is our biggest trading partner. And the, uh, the trade in digital information has just you know, grown uh, exponentially. Uh, I think the, the Safe Harbor uh, Agreement was a way uh, a practical way that allowed Europeans who were concerned about how their data was being treated in the U.S. to have some assurances uh, uh, that it was um, adequate. And the FTC was the enforcement arm of that. So if companies had uh, certified that they were um, adequate and they had fallen out of certification or weren't uh, following uh, the rules, the FTC could bring an enforcement action. As we all know, uh, that sort of all got upended by the recent uh, decision in, in the Schrems case. So I'm hopeful. Uh, I think there's two things. Uh, first of all, I think uh, that there are some paths that companies can use to continue to share data uh, between uh, European countries and the U.S. that still meet uh, European uh, requirements. I'm hopeful that we can um, move forward uh, together uh, between the U.S. and Europe to come up with a new system that meets European concerns while continuing to allow this uh, you know, free flow of information. Because it's so beneficial 
to the Europeans' own economic uh, you know, interests to allow this to continue. I think trade you know, increases wealth. It increases wealth for both sides. Uh, I, I hope that the Europeans will uh, take this uh, in, into consideration as they come up with a new approach, not one that locks down data too much into little you know, uh, um, fortresses in, in, each, in each country, because they think ultimately uh, that will hurt both sides of the Atlantic. First, thank you very much. Great talk. Uh, you mentioned along the way the number of federal agencies uh, that have current regulatory oversight in some way, shape, or form over the Internet of Everything. Um, can you speculate or, or offer any thoughts about, about the merits of that sort of unwieldy oversight mechanism? Should it be consolidated in any respect, or uh, is it appropriate to have continued oversight by a variety of agencies and just let, uh, let that process run its course? So there have been some calls uh, for you know, some kind of you know, uh, unified regulatory structure for the Internet of Things. I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense right now because we're not really sure w what the need is or where there are regulatory gaps that need to be filled. Uh, so that is uh, one of the uh, reasons why I supported the FTC's Internet of Things report was we didn't make a legislative recommendation for Internet of Things specific regulation. Um, so right now I'm not sure that um, agents, that it's necessarily, a, I mean it's a, it's a challenge for the Internet of Things to adapt to all these different regulatory structures. But if each regulator is looking at it as saying, what do I really know and what is the harm that's happening and then how do I target <coughs> uh, my approach to, to um, minimize that harm and uh, maximize the benefits without trying to come up with some you know, overarching, you know, solve every problem kind of regulatory structure. I think having a lot of different agencies isn't necessarily bad, but you need each agency to stick very closely to what it knows really well and to address the harm that it, it understands the best. And that is actually occurring or is very likely to occur. Thank you for the plug for my book. Oh, well, um, it's, uh, well yeah, deserved. Appreciated. Um, so one of, the, one of the, the sort of lesser publicized aspects of the FCC's open internet order was that by uh, reclassifying uh, broadband providers as common carriers, uh, they magically come out of the jurisdiction of the Federal Trade Commission under the common carrier exemption, uh, or at least that's what it looks like on paper. Is that, the, is that your view and is that the view of the FTC <coughs> that you're now out of the business of of uh, regulating, for example, unfair practices or privacy policies, excuse me, of, uh, of ISPs, however that ultimately is defined? I am concerned about that because the FTC has been an active enforcer uh, for privacy, online privacy really since there was you know, an online <laughs> experience for consumers going back to the 90s. I was actually at the FTC when we brought the first online privacy case called GeoCities back in 1999, if anyone can remember what GeoCities was. Um, so I, I think the FTC has been a pretty good cop on the beat here, and one of the, my concerns is that as we try to move, and we have sued, um, you know, some ISPs. Uh, so, so the question is, uh, if there is fraud happening, if there is deception happening, and that the FTC tries to bring an enforcement action, that's the defense that's going to be raised against us. They're going to say, "Oh, I'm a, I'm a common carrier. You can't, you can't reach me." Uh, and one of the concerns that I have is that, um, first of all, it creates an unlevel playing field. Uh, and as I said, kind of takes an experienced privacy and deception enforcer off the beat uh, to, pu to put another one um, on who may not have quite the same regulatory, uh, well, I would say, uh, enforcement tools. The other, the other problem there is the FCC gave itself a lot of wiggle room in that order about what is going to be considered, you know, a broadband service, right, bias, broadband internet access service. Uh, and so to the extent they would ever want to try to reach edge providers, well, that would draw that circle of, quote, common carriers even broader. And so that would kind of push even more of the FTC's traditional oversight authority um, out of the picture. So, so I am concerned, I am concerned about that. 
Great. Well, thank you for that. And uh, thank you again. Uh, please join me in thanking Commissioner Olhausen for her <laughs> wonderful comments. Thank you. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Carolyn Brandon. Okay, speakers, join me down in the pit, please. So I was saying during the break that for about 50% of the audience, the first part of today's conversation was just fabulous. Lots of information in the weeds about technology. For the other 50% of the audience, I think most of you were wondering, what have I just walked into and why am I here? So for this portion of our programming, we are going to be addressing some of our discussion to that part of the audience who was trying to make sense of all of the abbreviations and the technology discussion and bring it down to a level of money and business and practicality. So the original 50% of the audience, this is the portion where you might be wondering, why am I listening to this? <laughs> but I promise, if nothing else, it'll be entertaining. So I'm Carolyn Brandon. I'm with the Georgetown Center. I am joined by an esteemed uh, array of colleagues. Uh, Peter Rasavi, who is our partner in crime for today's event, runs the Wireless Technology Association, is an RF expert and a dear friend. So thank you, Peter, for agreeing to stand down for being a moderator and actually being a panelist. We have Roger Entner, who has founded and has run Recon Analytics. He is also probably familiar to many of you in the audience since he has been around the industry for over 20 years at various and sundry analyst firms. Thank you, Roger, for coming down from Boston. Thank you. Jennifer Fritchie is one of the most senior analysts covering this space. She has been doing it for about 15 mm -hmm. years or so. Um, and very, very proud to say that she is also one of the very few women who has been covering this space. So very, very grateful for you coming in from Chicago. And certainly, last and not least, Jim Kohlenberger, thank you. Former advisor in the Clinton White House, is running his own firm. Very, very smart individual, and I think we might actually kick off our conversation with Jim, if you don't mind, since you have the misfortune of sitting right next to me. So just as a setup to this conversation, um, CTIA, it's a trade association here in DC, has issued a report recently that said licensed spectrum developed and put into operation by commercial carriers has generated about $400 billion in economic activity. In 2003, another uh, stat released by CTIA, U.S. consumers and businesses spent about $172 billion on wireless services. So when we are talking about the economic implications and the business case for this thing we're all talking we're all referring to as 5G, I think it is not a leap to suggest that we're talking about real dollars, both on the investment side, into the networks that are going to bring you the sorts of capabilities that we heard about this morning, as well as productivity enhancements and all of the other economic gains that have been traditionally identified as flowing from the establishment of wireless broadband networks. That should, sort of, that should make it clear why having this conversation right now is actually really important when you look at the state of the U.S. economy. So with that, Jim, if you could talk a little bit about some of the thoughts that you articulated in your paper in terms of what are the nearest term use cases, translated, what's the business model, how are we going to monetize the investments that you see flowing from the kinds of capabilities a 5G world can bring? Well, thank you, Carolyn. It's great to be here and totally excited to be here not just because I'm a policy nerd and a technology geek, but because I'm really excited about, I think, what's around the corner and what's, what's ahead. And you mentioned these CTIA stats in terms of the incredible um, you know, jobs, economic growth, um, new apps, things to, you know, that we can do now with uh, mobile devices that we couldn't have uh, done before has just been phenomenal, and yet the best is yet ahead. And I think, it's, I think we're going on this exponential curve um, forward. And if we, if we think about some of the technologies that people discuss that these 5G networks uh, will enable, um, blazing fast speeds, that'll, you know, with um, speeds at least 10 times faster than we have today, right, which will enable us to keep up with the insatiable consumer demand that is now doubling every 18 months on these mobile broadband networks. If we think about these lower latencies, um, uh, in terms of uh, what we can do as we shrink these latencies. Um, I mean, not only does it enable new types of industrial control systems and other things, but, but think about, anybody ever tried virtual reality and got sick uh, using it? Recently. Recently? Not back in the 70s. I mean, <laughs> you know, and what, what's phenomenal is some of these technologies haven't come to fruition because latencies are too high. As we can start shrinking latencies, we can unlock entire new applications 
for consumer interaction. They can mean huge things for people with disabilities. Um, but one of the areas, I think, in this 5G area that, uh, that people are talking about um, in terms of what it can enable is whole new classes of uh, technologies. As we lower the uh, power energy density, per bit density down, um, you know, a thousand fold, meaning that we can put devices literally everywhere. So what, is, what does that mean? It means that everything can be connected, will be connected. It means that the smart revolution will move from our palm of our hands to literally every sector of the economy. And this is where I think is really exciting. So um, if we think, you know, think about it this way. The internet, since we, you know, t in the last 20 years, um, you know, it's been phenomenal. It's uh, created as much economic growth in the last 15 years as the industrial age did in 50 years. Think about that, that's amazing. But what it's only done is transformed about 20% of our economy, right? We've, we've transformed finance, we've transformed uh, entertainment and all that. What, that's amazing, but what it means is that the other 80% of the economy, um, the parts of the economy that have traditionally lagged in their take up of information technology, are now poised to be transformed as we can move these uh, connected devices and sensors into manufacturing, into farming and agriculture, into healthcare, into these other sectors that have largely lagged. Now, when economists take a look at this, they take a look and say, wow, if you look at when the original internet took off, just a 1% productivity growth enabled this economy <laughs> to grow at uh, some of the fastest rates um, that it has. And so now today, uh, economists are taking a look at as we move these 5G networks out and combine it with cloud computing and the other uh, types of technologies that go with it, just that 1% gain throughout other sectors of the economy can mean as much as 15 trillion in economic growth by 2030. That's like adding an entire US economy to the global economy. So, you know, 5G isn't all of it, but it's part of this whole thing. And as we take a look at these technologies, my sense is there's, the, you know, one of the killer apps is the ability to boost the economy. The other big killer app <coughs> is to be able to use these technologies to solve our bigger challenges. And so when you think about how these things go and they move into these other sectors of the economy, it enables us to totally transform healthcare with tricorder-like devices, new types of medical monitoring, new types of wearables. As we move into transportation, it allows us to do what UPS is doing with 120 sensors in, in every truck to be able to cut their, you know, boost their productivity just by 1%. Um, and each truck that enables huge savings across the board. Um, in, in manufacturing, in agriculture, there's huge gains as, you know, we see droughts in other parts of the economy to be able to target resources really directly and even target individual animals as they have wearable devices to kind of boost their productivity and, and make, you know, and, and boost that kind of farm to forth. did you say? Um, animals. I thought, I thought so. Yeah. And there's some am amazing things happening around the globe as people look at this. And that's the beauty of when we can connect virtually everything. We can solve big problems that we haven't been able to solve before. So I think there's huge economic gains and huge public policy gains that we can get as we move in this 5G direction. All right, so this does sound pretty cool. And for policy geeks, you know, kind of exciting. Um, I don't hear any oohs and ahs from the audience. I'll just assume you're thinking it. And this is actually from a man who I, you have two... Uh, connected devices on any others that we're not seeing? Oh, I've got lots. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, it, all kidding aside, Jennifer, um, you know, you are, you know, sharing the perspective of folks who, you know, have to write big checks or, or be right. in support of big checks being written for the investment here. Can you share some thoughts about, you know, business cases that you're hearing folks either get excited about or that you see actually becoming a little bit more real beyond just sort of like, wow, this is going to be very cool. I think I'll share that enthusiasm for sure, all the carriers. I'm what's called just as background a cell site analyst, so I represent or I follow about 20 carriers and um, tower companies and I write reports. My client base is anyone who might manage your 401k or IRA, uh, what we call portfolio managers. And so I have to tell them whether they should buy or sell AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, et cetera. And um, from the carrier side, I think there's great enthusiasm about all the trends that Jim has talked about. I think the question always becomes, and I'm kind of the bad balance sheet guy, is how, did, how is this all going to be paid for? And, you know, we, we almost our anniversary on the start of the AWS 3 auction, which, you know, if we all, or if my group in the, in the finance community predicted what that would fetch, I think the most aggressive estimate was about $27 billion, and you know it came in at $45 billion. And so you had pretty big carriers say, 
like not step away completely, but I would say Verizon made a pretty bold statement that said we're not, we're not chasing these valuations. In fact, I was with the CFO shortly after the quiet period ended in February, and his call and um, that of their CTO at the time was that spectrum prices were, in, in their view, a bubble and that they felt that they could do it better through small cells. Now, I think, as we've heard all morning, it takes a combination of both. Um, but from a carrier side, the, we, and from an investor side, we need to see what we call a return on capital, so that this money that's being invested, there is a return for it. The carriers are facing a lot of pressure right now. Um, T-Mobile certainly had a renaissance. Sprint's kind of sitting up. Um, AT&T and Verizon are, it's not as easy as it was for them before. Um, ARPU's average revenue per users are a bit under pressure. Um, you're seeing costs escalate. You're seeing spectrum prices escalate. So that from the standpoint of all of their enthusiasm, it's very much measured with how are we going to pay for this. So I think that brings in discussions of other, of other matters. But um, you know, it's worth noting that Verizon, who was, I was talking to Tom earlier at, um, at the break, that who was the first to talk about LTE is really the only one that's mentioned 5G, and they did so right before the CTIA conference. I don't think that by any means was an accident. So um, you know, I would expect it to become much more a conversation in my world. It's certainly already in your world. Do you have any thoughts, or have you heard, perhaps not a tribute to any particular company, but thoughts about what folks, I even beyond the carrier community, how folks are thinking about monetizing the kinds of capabilities, assuming they make the investment that we've been talking about in the billions? I mean, I think there was a big shift in the summer of 2012 when the two largest ones stopped unlimited da data. Um, you know, the, the, if they continue to go down that road, I think the fear of becoming big, dumb, empty pipes was very real. So now it's, you know, use as much as you want, but you're going to have to pay for it. Now, T-Mobile and Sprint haven't really embraced that model yet. I feel like the days of unlimited data for them is a period of months, not years. So um, I think that's a really important shift that we've seen the industry take, that from where we sit, my sit, it was a really positive move. So Roger, just switching gears for a quick second, um, do you have any thoughts as to these near-term use cases either from a consumer perspective, i.e., you know, products or services that will be out there in the marketplace that folks like you and I or Jim might want to subscribe to and or, you know, services that might come to fruition that are appealing to small businesses? Well, I think the, uh, the Internet of Things and, and here, especially around the medical industry, are, are very tangible use cases where uh, assisted living and, and, and aging in place um, are, are helping tremendously where you're connecting everything down uh, to the pill bottle so that you can check if somebody who is aging in place actually is taking their medicine, which is one of the most common problems. And it's like um, that, that you're taking the, the wrong medicine, the wrong doses or not at all. Uh, I think uh, the Fitbits uh, of this world and, and, and fitness where you are uh, collecting data nonstop is uh, helping tremendously uh, as well. Uh, <coughs> but, you know, I think the connected car is the next, is the next thing. But uh, I don't think it's everything is as well as, as it could be uh, because uh, with the, um, with, with Title II uh, that, that the FCC um, uh, brought upon us, uh, there are significant restrictions on uh, network, or, or prohibitions around network prioritization. And a lot of applications that are very latency dependent uh, cannot, cannot be uh, prioritized. So, for example, heart monitors will have exactly the same priority as, as Netflix. Uh, potential self-driving cars and collision uh, prevention will have the same uh, priority as, uh, as Spotify. Uh, where it should be pretty intuitive 
that for these things to be, really re to be really adopted and be very, very useful, they need to take precedent over um, regular consumption uh, entertainment. And it, it's, I, I look at it as a regulatory view of like looking in the, in the back mirror of the things that we have and protect the things we have rather than looking forward uh, to the things we could have and by looking backwards we're almost putting stones in the way or we're pu we're, we are putting stones in the way uh, of, of what could be and what could be uh, extremely useful and helpful. I was hoping to avoid taking this conversation in the direction of Title II, so I'm we'll sorry. just move right on past <laughs> Roger. We will come back to you, however, and perhaps it can be touched upon in the questions. But Peter, without getting into the substance of the next panel, which I think will talk in great detail about spectrum and network architecture, can you share some thoughts around you know, what you see as the current US spectrum policy in terms of spectrum in the pipeline or not in the pipeline? where the U.S. stands relative to international spectrum harmonization and whether you think we have, you know, are we ready here in the United States to enable the sort of 5G capabilities that you and your team were talking about this morning? Uh, well, it, it, it remains to be seen. Um, there, the FCC issued their um, notice last year and, you know, that was fairly timely. Um, but there are some real uh, demanding, challenging deadlines approaching. Uh, we intend to, or the standards, the global standards community, which actually is quite fragmented, but between ITU and 3GPP, the, um, the two of the main players, the intent is to have 5G standards in place by 2020. And then uh, related to that is the world um, radio communication conference for harmonizing spectrum and, and there's a large uh, meeting uh, end of this year and then another one in 2019 and by 2019 we're supposed to on a global basis have determined what um, what are the preferred 5G bands and um, that will be our best shot at global harmonization. So is the U.S. doing what it needs to do to participate in that? Um, it's, it's too early to tell, but the stakes are huge. Um, we, we have allocated, um, we've, we've done an okay job in allocating spectrum so far for, um, for LTE, um, but the industry can consume and, and, and needs much more spectrum than we have right now. Uh, if you look at LTE, the way we've allocated LTE is, especially at, say, 700 megahertz, our band plan is completely different from what other countries have done. The ability to roam on LTE today is abysmal. Um, in 2G, 3G, there is fairly good global roaming and you can access many networks around the world on a small number of bands. For LTE, it's disastrous in, in comparison. Um, and we absolutely want to avoid that kind of mess with 5G. So I think it's essential that policy people um, developing spectrum policy be cognizant of the requirement for global harmonization. Um, we're well past the days where one country can just do it by itself. Um, the, our products, our, the economies of scale for infrastructure, for devices, um, ha has gotten to the point where the whole world needs to do the same thing if we're going to realize the potential of these technologies. So my spectrum um, experts can elaborate on that. Um, in greater detail, but the stakes are huge um, and, and we are in the early days of the process and I hope we get it right. So just to, to make sure that um, I'm hearing you correctly, the, the point about LTE roaming experience being so dreadful, you attribute to the fact that we have upwards of 25 different slices, as it were, of LTE that are out of sync with where many countries around the world are. Well, the, the way UHF spectrum, um, 700 megahertz, our band plan is different. Our situation, um, a number of countries are using 2.5 gigahertz. 
um, for LTE and our uh, two and a half gigahertz situation is completely different because um, because Sprint one carrier has most of the licenses and and the rest of it is is very fragmented as well. So. Um, it may be over time that'll settle down as spectrum gets refarmed, as 2G spectrum gets moved to LTE. It's possible that some of the existing cellular and PCS spectrum um, become the global LTE um, roaming bands, but we're, we're nowhere close to that point yet. So Jim, can I um, hop back to you? Um, this, this issue of global leadership, I think you know, traditionally the United States has shown tremendous thought leadership and in many cases, leadership in terms of innovation, whether it's the chipset or the actual device or you know, network technology. Can you share some thoughts about where you see the U.S. on a global scale standing relative to 5G? Are other countries focused on it? Are they further ahead in terms of their planning and their thinking? And where do we fit into that? Well, great question, because as we sit here today, there's a global race on for leadership in, in 5G. And you know the great news is is that we are the global leaders in 4G. We got 98 percent percent penetration across the country. We've got about half of all global subscribers. We've done really well in 4G, but the challenge is people are acting. You know, other countries are acting uh, uh, aggressively, um, proactively to help take the lead uh, in 5G. Uh, in Europe, for example, um, you know, out of fears that they had lost the race in 4G. Uh, European leaders set aside $1.8 billion in a public-private partnership uh, in an effort to get ahead in, um, in 5G. South Korea, um, when they host the uh, 2018 Olympics, are gonna, the, what they hope to have is one of the first demonstration 5G networks out. Uh, Japan, when they follow in 2020, they also are in a race to help uh, you know, deploy an early um, 5G networks. China, Russia, Finland, they're not far behind. And these things are often taking place on these uh, you know, on the, on the stage of these global Olympic competitions because this is a race. This is a race for the future. And I think these, these countries are often going into this, you know, in part with three things um, that they're thinking about. One is they understand that wireless is key to a country's global competitiveness. I mean, they've seen how in the U.S., um, you know, wireless industry has been, if you will, the proverbial, you know, goose who laid the golden egg. Uh, that has delivered incredible benefits and they want to be a part of that. Two is they want to help shape the uh, technologies of the, of the future and they want to be able to have those next uh, Facebooks and the next, um, you know, all of our tech leadership, they want to see it located um, there. And importantly, I think they're also looking at these technologies um, to help solve some of their um, broader challenges. And when I look out, you know, ironically, 15 years ago this week, I walked in a memo to uh, President Clinton on uh, 3G wireless, and it was a memo to all agencies in an effort to get us ahead. But I think we need to think strategically and proactively now about 5G. We're not going to win this race by uh, resting on our laurels or uh, just by continuing by inertia. I think we need a strategic and comprehensive plan to figure out how we can lead this world. And I, I think of it as a plan to mobilize America. I see uh, uh, Blair in the back who did a great job of uh, putting together a national broadband plan. And frankly, I think we need the equivalent for a plan for Mobilize America to be able to take a look at how do we accelerate the benefits, the opportunities, um, and the policy um, framework uh, to be able to do so. And I just put together a paper that I think lays out some of these key things. But first, we need to be able to continue our lead in 4G. 4G is going to be with us a while, and so the best way to win in 5G is by keeping our pedal to the metal and, and keeping um, you know, our 4G train uh, driving forward. And we still have a lot of runway left in terms of upgrades and capabilities. Um, in the 4G networks, but Spectrum is going to be the key, um, you know, enabler. But we also need to uh, have policies that, uh, you know, foster investment and innovation. We need to uh, crank up the innovation uh, engine once again with uh, more basic R&D. We need to fill the STEM pipeline with the people who will help invent these new things. But importantly, I think we need to get started today with a plan to help mobilize America. And you haven't thought about this at all? I have not. <laughs> Really quick question, Jennifer. I know you travel um, abroad in meeting with clients. Mm -hmm. Do you hear any chatter uh, in Europe or elsewhere among companies, carrier or otherwise, in terms of investments or what 5G might look like? Not, it hasn't come up as much. I mean, the European model, every time I go over there, I mean, the one thing that's cheaper over there is your cell phone. I mean, they think we're all crazy for paying what we do in monthly cell phone bills. And that's, it's so surprising to me. So, um, you know, th they really haven't, 
at least it's tri not trickled down to the customer or the investor standpoint. Again, I think it's probably in the circles that Jim's referring to, but certainly not in the investor cycle at this point. And Roger, do you see any, um, you know, just in terms of the research that you typically track um, outside of economic impact of, of X or Y Z developments, um, any any chatter from the consumer perspective, or, or is 5G really just kind of a, a, an amorphous term that no one's really wrapping their head around what, what that is or developing expectations around it? Well, I think from a consumer's perspective, it's the use case. Uh, and, and there is excitement around the things that, that are coming. Uh, there's a little bit trepidation when you hear about a car being hacked, but there's a lot more excitement about what you can do with it. Uh, the consumer generally is technology agnostic. If, if the thing would work with smoke signals, and the consumer wouldn't care. So uh, we shouldn't be too hung up that, you know, which G is actually going to do this, because 5G will have a lot of components of, of 4G, and, and we're still not done defining this. I think, you know, when we ask everybody in the... In, in, this, in this room, we will come out with more opinions than our people in the room of what 5G actually will be in the end. Uh, so I'm, I'm not concerned. I think there's excitement about the things that will come, and that's, I think, is the most important thing. Consumer so demand is there. So I would be remiss if I didn't um, ask you to, to address the, the reality that Jennifer was describing in terms of citizens on the ground in, in some <coughs> European countries feeling that the, the Americans are just paying way too much in their bills. I know you've done a lot of comparative work. Any insights there as to what's happening? Well, Americans are using a lot more uh, uh, as well. So it's the, uh, you pay for, for, for what you're using. Uh, that, that really is, uh, is, is a place. And, you know, American carriers, a lot of the problems in Europe you can trace back to the 3G <coughs> disasters where uh, the, the European carriers paid a lot for spectrum and continue to be at the um, uh, metered approach. So every megabyte you used, uh, you paid more. Every uh, minute you used, you paid more. Whereas the US carriers, a lot more with buckets, a lot more with uh, unlimited that you didn't have in Europe. And so Americans abandoned the landline in huge droves, which doesn't really happen. The same cord cutting didn't really happen to that extent in Europe. So we have moved much more dramatically than the Europeans to a uh, wireless economy. You have there a lot of penetration. You know, my uh, but penetration means you have a phone and with caller party pays, uh, even if you have a zero bill, you still have a connection because when somebody calls you, they pay. And, and so penetration numbers are very high, usage numbers are, are low, whereas here in the U.S., we have really high, 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 min high, high voice usage. You know, you always hear about, oh, it's the end of, uh, of calling. When you look at the actual numbers, we're using roughly as many minutes as we have ever used. It's just that we're using a lot more text messages, and <coughs> we all remember that, oh, Europe is the, uh, uh, the land of texting. Well, Americans are using 10 times more texts than Europeans. So in almost every measure, Americans are using more, are communicating more wirelessly. So, um, it, it's, a, it's a great, when you look at the actual behavior, it's, it's a great success story. So I, I think what we've heard so far is spectrum policy is going to be a key driver of this uh, brave new world that we've been talking about. And Jim, I know you, you know, very clearly and passionately made the case that as a, as a country, we need a plan, a roadmap for how we're going to get there. But can we spend a few minutes talking a little in a little bit more detail as to what could the federal government here in the United States actually do, in your view, both near, near term and long term, to facilitate the sorts of innovation, access to spectrum, that I think everybody agrees needs to happen if, in fact, we're going to maintain global leadership within wireless broadband and 5G is going to hit here sooner rather than later. And really, this is directed to all of you. So, 
Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to address that. I'd like to just um, add to um, Roger's comment about the G's and, and cutting the cord first, though. Oh, um, sure, the engineer on the panel has to be specific. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think consumers are not, they're probably going to be baffled by 5G because we already did it to them with 3G and 4G because we took 3G, enhanced it slightly, and then called it 4G, and then true 4G came along, and we couldn't call it 4G anymore, so we had to call it 4G LTE, and I, and I think the average person probably has no idea what is the difference between 4G and 4G LTE. So, um, But I think as far as cutting the cord, that's really true for voice. I think the next big break and something that will excite consumers is cutting the cord to their wireline broadband. And if you can have your wireless broadband be the only broadband, and some percentage of population is there, but I think 5G has the potential of way increasing that percentage number, and that should get people excited. Um, as it is for myself, I, 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 for, for my business travel, I mostly just tether my laptop to my phone nowadays, and it's, it's all I need. And I used to worry about how many gigabytes I consume, and as the operators have nicely you know, increased their data buckets, it's almost impossible for me to consume my plan at this point doing business. Now, if I want to watch high-definition Netflix videos, I can burn through it um, still pretty easily. Um, but as far as spectrum policy goes, one of the problems for operators, and this is something I've analyzed, is that deploying generations of technology takes massive investment. We're talking about tens of billions on a global scale, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, Jennifer, maybe you've added it up globally. I, I haven't. Um, it also requires very long-term planning horizons. Um, and, and, and it involves decisions on which generation of technology put into what band at, in what year. And really, these are five-year-plus plans that operators have. And the only way those plans can be really implemented efficiently is to understand what spectrum is coming when. And I think probably one of the, the biggest problems with spectrum policy is that all of our allocation of spectrum over decades has basically been haphazard. It's almost like an experiment each time about how we'll do it this time. I mean, look at the incentive auctions. They're going to be the most complex auction ever conducted by humans in the history of the human race. Right, so maybe we need to do something different there because of the incumbents, the broadcasters, and so forth. But hopefully, as we look at 5G and look at the next 20 years, um, because we're going to be looking at all kinds of new band allocations and, you know, at 28 gigahertz, 40, 60, 70, so forth, and, and the spectrum panelists will be talking about the different bands we're looking at. Um, hopefully, there will be some kind of clear roadmap of how that becomes available. I think that's one of the essential things we're looking for in policy. I, you know, I would add to that. You know, I think I think not only do we need a cleared roadmap, and certainly there's a you know a standards process and work process that's uh, a work um, a process for identifying bands and and um, but this pipeline we need to not just fill it. Um, and, and have a strategic plan for where those are going to go and whatnot. But I think right now, when, when we don't know exactly which bands, we need to be thinking about the incentives and the tools that we can use today to help incent. Some of this is going to come from the federal side, and we need to think, I think, creatively and strategically about how do we create the right set of incentives um, for agencies to be able to move forward. One of the things you know I'm passionate about is I think that as you look at these networks and you look at what they're going to be capable of doing, I think that the missions of what these agencies um, have to accomplish, they're going to benefit tremendously um, from these networks themselves. And I think, I think that helps them as they try to do the trade-offs, as agencies try to do the trade-offs of, uh, well, wait a second, I need to hang on to this spectrum because I need it for this. Actually, the, you know, as we move to these 5G networks, they're going to need these 5G networks, I think, even more than some of their um, current networks. And I think we need to be able to help them frame that uh, incentives, but also provide kind of the economic incentives as well 
um, for them to be able to move forward and move out of this by recovering the cost that it takes for them to move. And I think there's, there's some planning and some thought that we should be doing deliberately today to get ahead of that. Do, um, do any of, this, of the panelists have thoughts about things the uh, FCC, or again, I'll just say writ large, the federal government, can or should be doing relative to simplifying and speeding up the siting of infrastructure? That's something that we sometimes hear about, um, Jennifer or Roger. Yeah, I, we follow the tower companies as well. Um, I think that's been a real issue. Um, but I, I would agree with both um, gentlemen who just spoke that, Peter, and Jim, that the spectrum policy is so, like if you look at what AT&T has done since they announced the DirecTV merger in May of 2014, they closed on it and they still are not spending on wireless. In fact, they're doing the opposite and really spending on fiber in the ground, which I think speaks very loudly to where the confusion they're seeing on the, the, the wireless space. I think they need to see what they get in the broadcast auction. They've actually walked away, no, it wasn't required, but their $9 billion commitment to bid for the broadcast auction. And so there, there seems to be a back away and it's left many wireless infrastructure companies in its wake with that. But I think, to answer your direct question, I think that zoning and the infrastructure stuff, there's much that can be done to make the process smooth, but it's a question of how aggressive are the carriers spending. I mean, starting with the biggest one. You know, they spend $21 billion a year. And for the last two quarters, wireline capex has been above wireless capex, which I think has been a, a very strong statement as to where their spend's going. Roger. Well, I'm, I'm an expert witness in uh, for, in uh, tower siting cases. And some of the um, uh, spurious reasons that, that some of the municipalities are, are employing are just uh, baffling. I was expert witness in a case where uh, a city denied a carrier to, um, to take an existing uh, church uh, tower and raise it by nine feet uh, from uh, 47 feet to 56 feet. And, that, and because it would impact the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the neighborhood. It's, they ultimately lost in federal court, uh, but that took more than four years uh, to, to actually get somebody to just add on uh, a couple of feet to, to a tower. And, th and there are many more cases of that where uh, municipalities are listening to uh, the concerns of their consumers uh, and are, w which on one hand you sympathize with them but they're not rooted in fact and are violating uh, the Telecommunications Act uh, in, in, in flying in the face of it. And there's no, there's no, rep no real repercussion for the, for the municipality to actually do that. So if there would be real repercussions for a municipality to spuriously deny a, a cell site request that lawfully has been uh, made, uh, I think the whole process would speed up a lot more. Uh, rather than rely on, on the good intentions and, and adherence to, to rules and regulations that have no teeth. I think it's a real challenge in part because one of the features of, of 5G that we're going to see is, is this continued uh, direction toward network densification and uh, greater use of small cells, which we need, we're going to need a lot more cells. And so I think the problem gets worse, and so we need to be able to solve these things up front. I do want to do a shout out uh, to some of the colleagues in the White House who, through, through their Smart City Initiative, and their Broadband Opportunity Council are looking at ways where they can get governments uh, to kind of get out of the way, do um, kind of dig one's proposals, do other types of things. You know, I'm, I'm always surprised when I travel the country, the places that I am least likely to get coverage are in and around federal lands. Um, and, uh, you know, I find it, you know, I think there's a lot that the federal government can do um, to help um, uh, advance the capabilities to get more, um, make it easier um, uh, to get tower sided and built. Yep. Jennifer, could you, um, and, and we'll, we're going to go ahead and take a break after this last question and take questions from the audience if you all have any. Um, but first, Jennifer, I think right thus far in this conversation, the focus really has been on the providers and the folks building out the, the radio access networks. 
Um, however, as, as Jim was just mentioning, and as we saw on some of the uh, slides this morning, you know, what we're talking about in these densi uh, this densification process is a lot more equipment hanging off a lot more facilities with a ton of fiber. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the potential for fiber companies out there? So we've done a lot of work on the fiber companies. We follow Level 3, um, Zayo is one. Um, you've seen the tower companies kind of get into the fiber world. I mentioned earlier AT&T spending. They have a commitment to the FCC, I'm probably preaching the audience, to cover 12.5 million homes with fiber in the four years following the close of the DirecTV deal, so 2019. We were at a meeting and John Stanky, COO essentially for AT&T, talked about that number actually probably being about 60% of their footprint. That they have 55 million homes, so that number is like 33 million. So fiber is everything here, and um, you know that's it's the infrastructure. It helps both their wireline network. They're doing the GigaPower initiative, but I think it has what people aren't doing is connecting the dots with wireless. I think CRAN's an obvious ar area. Um, so much of where it's going. I mean, we heard the gentleman from AT&T speak. They very much get it, and Verizon does too, because Verizon was kind of criticized for starting their Fios initiative in 2006, four maybe, and now the one gig is the new normal. I mean, they're very much vindicated with that strategy because you're even seeing my smallest, smallest Arlex, who Peter just killed the whole thesis on them by saying they're not going to have any wireline broadband, but hopefully Sorry. they'll be around. <laughs> <laughs> but um, even going rural, smaller ILEX going one gig. So I think we're way, if you had to use the banana, uh, baseball analogy, I think we're in like the warm ups. So um, way early in the fiber cycle. So there's a lot of room for growth here and yes. growth of business models across the ecosystem. I hate that word, but in most the definitely. Space. All right, I could go on more, but I would like to involve you in the conversation. Any questions from the audience? Thank you, uh, Reza Rafi with Intel. Um, great uh, discussions. A question I have, um, Carolyn, you started with uh, some statistics about the mobile industry and, and uh, how it's growing and all that, which was quite interesting. The question for, um, for the panelists is, is as follows. Um, we, know, we know that for, for the growth to continue, especially with 5G coming up, uh, there's going to be need for spectrum, there's going to be need for capital. When we look at the uh, mobile industry within the wireless industry, mobile industry is by far uh, the largest, but the greatest impact on both uh, social and economic aspects everywhere in the world. Um, do you think that the response from um, regulatory policies and also financial policies is, is adequate and proportional to, to the size of mobile industry with respect compared to, <coughs> compared to other wireless sectors such as broadcasting or satellite. Um, I just note that for instance, where, whereas the, the mobile industry uh, numbers are in the billions for instance, satellite numbers are in the millions, and I think we all appreciate the difference between a million and a billion. Um, so do you think that the response is adequate and proportional? Thank you. Great question, Reza. Jim? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think it's a great question. I do, I do think that what, you know, mobile is becoming the predominant communications platform of our time, right? Everything is moving. I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm struck at all of the amazing technologies that, um, uh, that our mobile devices have eaten, um, right? We no longer have tom-toms in our cars uh, to, for GPS. We no longer have carried digital cameras. Um, we no longer have uh, VCR cameras. Um, we we watches, watches, right. I mean, you know, so it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's gobbling up these sectors more and more. And I think as it moves into more and more sectors of the economy, it's going to continue that thing. And I think even though it's about 3% of GDP or it's three, uh, I forget the exact number, right? I think that its impact on the broader economy is, is much more dramatic and much more. Thing. And I do think that that's why, one of the reasons why I think policymakers need to and have been um, spending more time thinking about uh, getting ahead of it. And that's clearly why these other countries around the globe, I think they recognize this is a, a predominant driver of economic and uh, uh, opportunity benefits. And I think that's one of the reasons why they're uh, getting ahead of this. And I, I, you know, I think those countries that um, think about it strategically and think about it as a, um, uh, in broader ways are those countries that are going to continue to lead in the, in the world. 
And I, I think we need more uh, policymakers and regulators to think like Commissioner Olhausen uh, with her regulatory uh, humility and think about how can we enable, how can we make e progress easier rather than protect against imaginary harms. Uh, and, and I think that would go a long way. And the, the reality on the ground is that a lot of the old legacy uh, technologies are used by older and the voting population, which has a disproportionate voice, uh, whereas the new technologies are by younger non-voting parts, and, uh, and we should look at towards the youth and look at what they do regardless of how strongly they're represented here in, in, in Washington, because that is where the country will be 20, 30, 50 years down. We, will, we, live in the fu we don't live in the past, we live in the future. Or, and we live in the house and, and the conditions that we create now for the future. And I think we should look more towards that of what are the, the framework that we want to live in rather than what we have lived in. I think, Reza, um, I'll take my moderator hat off for a quick second and put my Georgetown uh, Center hat on for a quick minute. And that is, I think the short answer is no. I don't think the response has been in proportion to the potential loss to our productivity enhancements, our job creation, and all of the other things that we have seen come with the advancements of mobile network technologies. On the other hand, that's not to suggest that regulators and policymakers aren't talking about it and saying things and using words. I think there is a, a fundamental disconnect between what the potential actually could be and their understanding of where they are today. And I don't know that they fully grasp how to get from here to there. But as Jim said, you know, there are a lot of folks, uh, certainly in this town, that are trying to get their heads around it. Um, but thus far, I think the, the reaction has been relatively slow, especially in the face of where we know our global competitors are, are headed and how much resources, how many resources they are devoting to getting ahead uh, when it comes to 5G. Yeah, for example, I just went even a year ago when we had the um, policy speaker from Japan, they were able to present a 5G spectrum roadmap that showed something like a gigahertz of new spectrum that Japan was making available in like the next five years, which is way beyond what is being contemplated in the U.S. Go ahead. Another question? Yeah, we're still waiting for the second yeah. half of the 500. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this may be a, a little bit heretical, but being somebody who's, who's, who's deep in, in the mobile industry, one of the things that's, it, and this was brought up before, the comment about mobile usage in the U.S. versus mobile usage in, in, um, in Europe. And there's a question that I have in my mind about what the real economic impact is of mobile networking on, in a macroeconomic sense. Because somehow we seem to have placed a really high value on it in the United States, and I'm completely behind that and everything. It's a very good thing. But somehow the Europeans haven't, to the extent that we have. They don't use it as much. They haven't really built it out as, as rapidly as we have in the US. And yet we're still claiming there's this great economic impact of it. And so there's a question I have in my mind about why hasn't that happened? Why haven't we really seen that in the market in Europe? That's the first question. And then secondly, why is there at the same time this great motivation to drive 5G as quickly as possible? And again, I'm thinking about this mostly from an economic sense. Um, and there's a thing behind this also, because there's a certain marketing value to say I was first. And, and there was actually a reason why the U.S. deployed LTE first. And it was really driven by the right marketing, market conditions and the prior technologies that had been developed and some strategic positioning of, of the major uh, companies of Verizon and AT&T. Um, so maybe I, there's a whole bunch of things in this question because they're all connected together. Right. Somehow there's policy in this also, but the policy we usually like to get out of the way of the regulatory stuff, get that out of, way, out of the way as quickly as possible, then focus on the technology, get the technology known and understood, 
and then the market takes over when it's going to get deployed. The thing that I just found, I'll go back to the original question, which is, is there any thought about why in Europe there isn't this urgency to get 4G deployed very, very quickly, why they waited and continue to deploy it just from the economic value that it should give to their, their, uh, their, econ their economy? And I'll give that to anybody. It was just a, a question. Well, there is a substantial body of evidence that shows the positive correlation between uh, mobile usage and GDP growth. And um, uh, also when you look at it with the most recent auctions in Europe, uh, they have uh, re-auctioned a lot of spectrum and have deployed um, 4G. That whole uh, effort has led them to create really wide channels and uh, that has made it really easy for a European carrier to offer speeds that are a lot faster than in here in the US because our average channel is 5 or 10 megahertz, whereas there they now um, auctioned off 20 by 20 and uh, that has really sped up a lot of things. So I think what you see is the after effects. To a certain extent you see the after effects of the 3G auction that got bungled up by about everybody there, uh, which led to a significant hangover by the carriers that previously had significantly invested and nobody came because it was simply too expensive. And that led to them not investing as heavily as the US that has seen a much more uh, linear, or not linear, but a much more uh, smooth path to grow. The, the connection between revenue, investment, usage, and revenue has been much clearer for the US carriers than has been for the European carriers. Then they got a lot back and, and saw, especially when you see, the, the one thing that the European got out of their investment in Verizon and T-Mobile is to see how it was done here and apply these lessons in Europe, especially Vodafone benefited greatly from their investment in, in, um, in Verizon uh, Wireless. And their, their CFO, Andy Halford, has been the CFO of Verizon Wireless for many years before he got uh, elevated. So when the CFO kind of has seen it, how it actually works, he's much more likely to, to approve the funding and. And so I think the Europeans are in, in the catch-up phase and they're like, okay, we know what we've done wrong in the past and we're not going to do it again. And that's why they're so heavily investing and, and focusing on 5G. Can I just speak to the urgency? I mean, I'd reference actually many of the slides you showed. I mean, if it can give us greater capacity and some of the benefits on the cost side that they can see where some relief for because they're getting pressured on that revenue side. That's enough of an incentive because it is r very hard right now for the carriers to find a way. I mean, Peter referenced it earlier. They're giving, you know, I was paying $100 for 10 gigs, now I'm paying $100 for 15 gigs. And if I go to Verizon and mention Sprint or T-Mobile, they might throw in a little bit more. So you, you have seen them blink um, on pricing in a, in a throw more data in the bucket type of way. But that pressures them. And, you know, they, they're both, those two companies particularly, are companies that have very big dividends that AT&T has risen, you know, raised at 31 years or something like that. Yeah, there's, there's sure. That's there's a really interesting point. I mean, there was a point about the competition, mm -hmm. which they were really trying to drive in Europe by having so many operators that led to the roaming kind of debacle and the fragmentation of the market. Whereas we seem to have a much more consolidated market in the United States, I think the U.S. Uh, Europe is going in that direction, but it's been it's lagged really what the, what the U.S. has had, and it was I was just looking for some reasons why we seem to be leading, and we seem to be leading from the market perspective, not just from sheer will that we want to do it. It's really from an economic perspective. In most European markets, they consolidated down to three now. Uh, right, the, right the, now. The only now. But if, if I went back to 2010 when we started to deploy LTE, I don't think it was that way. It was typically four. Uh, th what's interesting is the UK, 
uh, ever so often. They, well, they, they let them consolidate and then they make it very attractive for a new entrant just for history to repeat itself. But other than that, the Europeans in most countries consolidate it down to three. I think a, a, a really interesting question, though, is is the flip: is is uh, you know where will we be looking you know ten years from now in terms of um, that five G rollout? And I do think that there's there's a couple things, right? In some ways, they're better positioned in terms of getting ahead. They've already made a commitment. They've ar they understand that they <laughs> they led in three G, they lost in four G, and they're trying to retake the lead in five G. And they've got different regular, you know, as, as um, Maureen Olhausen uh, uh, mentioned earlier, we've got 24 different sectors, who, uh, different, different agencies that somehow have a hook in kind of the Internet of Things and the types of technologies. That's because of the way, you know, we're set up and they've got a very different structure and they're trying to look for a more uniform um, uh, type of structure. And I think that speaks to the fact of why we need to uh, help get ahead of it because it's not, you know, I think right now, um, you know, we don't need to just look back, but we need to look forward in terms of how do we continue this incredible rollout of 4G here as a, as a foundation for the, for the 5G because we've got a lot of structural challenges that we uh, need to overcome so that 10 years from now we'll have a, the best story. All right, one last question and then we can break for some food. Cam. Hi, Cameron Corsi, AT&T. So uh, I, this is going to be a question, but it's also going to try to address that, that as well, because I think one of the reasons why uh, the United States has been so successful in rolling out new wireless technology, 4G LTE, has been Google and Apple. The fact that two of the biggest names in the smartphone world and tablet world are located here in the United States, and you know, when you go to Europe, you don't see the use of smartphones like you do here. Uh, you don't see the use of tablets almost at all. So, so that has made the, the, the carriers here have to build their networks out to a point where European uh, carriers haven't had to do that. So the question out of the panel, if that is truly part of the reason, then what can, what can we do in the United States to continue to foster that kind of innovation that will continue to drive us uh, as the leader uh, in the world in the wireless industry? So I think um, spectrum policy, right? So right. a clear path forward, not yeah. doing the herky-jerky. Um. Yeah, clear spectrum policy, um, as few roadblocks as possible, um, not restricting um, how, how networks will operate. I think in the U.S. we've done a good job in not saying what technology should be used and what band in other parts of the world. Operators don't have that flexibility. Um, that has helped. Um, you know, unlicensed has been a success story because we've had minimal rules and hopefully we'll keep minimal rules and unlicensed and we're sort of at a precipice where that may change and hopefully it won't. Um, so as few roadblocks and as many enablers as possible. I, I think it's a great question and I, and I think it's a, a spot on question of, of exactly how we should be thinking about this because one, we need to make sure we, we've got a pipeline on spectrum. Two, it takes this massive investment that we've been able to enable here, um, and we need to keep the policies in place that help foster predictability, innovation, and investment. Um, and, and that's exactly why these other countries are trying to get ahead of us, so that the next Googles and, and Apples are, are located there. Um, but importantly, I also think that there's another role that the federal government plays that has helped, you know, why, why is it Apple and Google are located here? Why, why is it here? And I do think that there's a federal R&D uh, component. When you take a look at your um, smartphone, whether it's the LCD screen, the uh, touch screen, um, the lithium ion batteries, um, Siri itself, all of them have their roots in uh, basic federal R&D. And uh, as well, you know, one of the things these other countries are doing is they're doing millimeter wave uh, research, they're doing basic network research. We've got NSF doing some of that, but I think there's, there's a set of things that our companies are able to do, but there's a set of things that are high risk, high reward things that we also need the federal government to keep investing in, and right now our uh, uh, R&D as a percentage of overall GDP is, is uh, not keeping pace with what other countries are doing. And it's another piece where we need to keep the basic R&D so that, especially as we move into the sensor world, um, where they're going to require a whole bunch of new capabilities and there'll be drivers for the network investment, there'll be drivers for capabilities. And I, I think there's a, a it, we really need a comprehensive strategy in all of these areas, taking all of these pieces into account so that we can continue to lead.
Yeah, and I, and I just want to want to echo that. I've Many years ago, I've been uh, at the National Science Foundation at the SBIR um, panel. Uh, I helped to select the, the, the worthy uh, applicants uh, for, for these cases. And I think if we would dedicate more money to that, uh, admittedly high risk, but of very often high reward, reward uh, uh, endeavors uh, would certainly help. I think overall we need to find ways of how we can accelerate innovation rather than slow it down. I think that has to come uh, from all parts, uh, not only the government but the companies uh, in the space. All of them have to uh, play a role of how to accelerate that. Well, I want to give Jennifer the last word. Um, so question about the investment climate, right? Mm -hmm. Assuming we're going to need a period of continued very high levels yes. of investment to get to the outcome that we're describing here. I mean, could you just say a few words about sure. the relative investment climate in the United States, where you see it, can it improve, and if so, any suggestions as to how that might happen? I mean, on paper, it certainly should improve. Like, I think there was a lot of us who follow the tower companies who were hoping and praying that once the DTV closed, AT&T's pent-up spending would occur on the wireless side. I mentioned earlier, we're not seeing that. Um, Verizon, I think, is kind of the tortoise in the race. They're not slow, but they're con incredibly consistent, and that has not changed. Um, Sprint and T-Mobile are the wild cards. I mean, I think then you've got to bring in the discussion of balance sheet here, and, you know, Sprint especially, is there's not a lot of wiggle room there. There's a big Japanese checkbook behind it, but it's, that's not um, necessarily guaranteed. You saw them move away from the upcoming auction, and you know they feel that they have enough spectrum to do it um, with a small cell initiative. So I would say we wish we could be more optimistic, just putting on my tower hat, about the um, overall carrier spend, but I think we got to look at what they're spending on and it seems to be centered around fiber, as I mentioned, and small cells. Um, and not, not as much on other things like we would like to see. So with that, um, please join me in thanking our speakers for uh, what I thought was a fascinating and obviously very timely conversation. Um, we now will break. There are box lunches, if I am correct, outside. We are not allowed to bring those into the auditorium. So there are a number of places on this floor and downstairs where there's couches and chairs and places to congregate. So if you guys could go ahead, grab some refreshments, and then we'll be back here at, what time? 1.30 for our next panel. Thank you all very much.